Test one, two. Can you guys hear me? Test one, two. Can you hear me? Testing. Oh, now, brown cow. <laughs> Can you hear me? Test one, two. You guys hear me? So, Paul, if you can, or... Paul, if you can give me a test count, they don't necessarily need to hear everybody online. Well, yeah, we do. We have board members online, so we have to get this audio working. Bud, you want to Testing one, testing two, one, two. Budge, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. No problem. You guys got me? Yep, we got you. Okay, I think and we're ready. Like we're pros. So when we do Chris Heron's update, he will be remote. All right, and some of the board members will have to, um, um, us, you know, answer to being here uh, remote yep. as well. So we'll have yep. to make sure that's ready. Okay. Can, Thanks, can guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna drop. Okay. Can you turn volume up on seventeen eighteen, just a little bit, and then probably you could probably pull this down, number thirteen down just a pinch. Testing one. Yep, we got good audio. Yep, I think we're good.
All right. Just want to make sure we got the audio working there. Good morning. Um, my name is Budge Courier. I'm going to uh, call the 911 Advisory Board for the month of November to order. And uh, the first order of business is to do roll call. So um, I believe Chief Baxter is online. Is that correct? Yes. Good morning, Budge. I'm here. Good morning. All right. Brenda Bruner. Mark Chase. Present. Rosa Ramos. Sheriff Braun. Sheriff Ayub. Present. All right. Uh, Tracy Gonzalez. Captain Ramirez. Present. Captain Warren. Here. And Chief White. Present. Okay, so we have a quorum. Uh, there are a couple of members that may be joining, but we certainly have a quorum. Uh, the next order of business is the approval of the meeting minutes. If you will recall, at the last meeting, there was some edits that were requested to be made to the May minutes. Uh, we went back and looked at the recording, which did not record. So um, there's a little bit of a problem there. Uh, we tried to capture as best we could what was said in those May meeting minutes, uh, and we did not have the recording to go back to. So um, I can't remember who it was that asked if, if we would go back and do those additions, but um, you'll probably remember who you are. Uh, if you could take a look at those May minutes, you've got a hard copy in front of you. Those uh, board members are online. Uh, you have an electronic version as well. And uh, welcome to accept any feedback on the May meeting minutes. Okay, do we have a motion to approve the May meeting minutes? Seeing as how there's no uh, comment on those. Chief White motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion from Chief White. We have a second. Rosa Ramos with a second. Rosa second. All right. Uh, any opposed to approving the May meeting minutes? Okay, so the motion carries. Um, we'll move on to the August meeting minutes. So those are also a hard copy in front of you. You've also received an electronic version prior to today's meeting. Um, I want to uh, entertain discussion about the August meeting minutes. If anybody has any adjustments or clarifications they need on those min meeting minutes. Okay, seeing and hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the August meeting minutes? Chief White, motion to approve. All right, a motion for Chief White. Do we have a second? Brenda Bruner, second. Brenda seconds that, thank you. All right, anyone opposed to approving the August meeting minutes? All right, motion carries. Um, we will be obviously posting a copy of those on our website so that they'll be available for others to view. Um, the next order of business is uh, agenda item number three, closed session and pursuant to government code 11126 ECHO. We're going to meet and we'll enter into closed session. We'll be adjourning upstairs. Um, I, I'm supposed to be advancing the slides. Paul's motioning to me. So uh, I'm caught up now. We're on item three. Thank you, sir. Um, so we're going to go into closed session. Um, we've got a, we'll be meeting actually up in the lab conference room. So we'll be in closed session uh, and we will report out on any members that were any items that were for public um, uh, discussion when upon our return. So we'll uh, move to the closed session. Yeah, those members that are online, um, if you can please join the closed session meeting. She should have received a Microsoft Teams meeting. Uh, join us there and we'll be there shortly as soon as it takes us to walk up to this uh, conference room. So we'll stand adjourned until then.
Okay, we, uh, we are back from closed session. I'm gonna take a roll call and then I'll give a report out. So, um, Chief Baxter. I'm here. Thank you. Brenda Bruner. Present. Mark Chase. Present. Rosa Ramos. Present. Sheriff Braun. Present. All right, Sheriff Ayub. Present. Tracy Gonzalez. Chief Ramirez. Present. Captain Warren. Present. And Chief White. Present. Okay, so during closed session, um, we did discuss um, some of the details of the testing that's going on out in the PSAP. And so we have a slide on that where we're going to repeat that information back here, but we did get into a little bit of that conversation uh, to provide some backdrop. So when we get to that slide, we'll, we'll be sure to point out that that's what we covered in closed session. You'll recognize the slide when you see it. Other than that, there's uh, nothing to report from the closed session. So um, moving on, we'll, we'll head to agenda item number four. We've got Reggie here to give us a legislative uh, update. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, folks. And uh, just in the interest of time, the, the bills that I will be reading will just be more of an annotated Reader's Digest version. And um, uh, if there's any questions, I'll be free to follow up on that. Now, just uh, for starters, uh, the governor did sign AB 988 uh, in September. And what 988 does is it establishes the Miles Hall Lifeline Suicide and Suicide Prevention Act. Um, multiple uh, provisions within the bill. Uh, what it also what it does, though, is it also requires that no later than July 1st of 2024, Cal OES will verify the interoperability between and across 911 and 988. And uh, it also requires uh, Cal OES to consult with specified entities on any technolo technology requirements for 988 centers. There is a legislative, uh, there, there is a um, uh, agenda item, so we can go further into that during, uh, if there's any other questions related to the bill during that uh, uh, item that's on the agenda. Uh, additionally, AB 22906 had been previously signed in the summer back in uh, June uh, by Assemblymember Patterson, which would exempt. So current law authorizes the PUC to control and regulate the use of automatic dialing announce, announcing devices to a telephone line, uh, and as well as uh, specifies the hours during which the devices may not be operated. Uh, additionally, it exempts from that control and regulation certain entities that use an automatic dialing announcing device under various situations, including contacting the parents and or guardians of pupils by schools regarding attendance and placing of calls by law enforcement agencies, fire protection agencies and public health agencies for specified purposes relating to public safety and emergencies. What the bill does is that it exempts from that control and regulation, the use of an automatic dialing announcing device for purposes of a school contacting parents or guardians of pupils regarding the health and safety of pupils. Additionally, SB 857 by Senator Weso uh, was also signed back in September, which extended the California High Cost Administrative Funds A and B uh, 
and the program requirements until January 1st of 2028, as I'm sure some folks here may recognize that that is actually a teleco fund that uh, the CPUC has established, uh, which is for use for telecom purposes throughout the state. So that is on the state side. Uh, on the federal side, uh, H.R. 1250, the Emergency Reporting Act by Congresswoman Matsui would require the FCC to report on certain activations of the Disaster Information Reporting System, or DERS, uh, and to adopt specified rules related to network outage reporting. Uh, that is currently in the Senate and uh, has been in the Senate since July. Uh, just again, as a reminder, uh, folks may be aware that we are now currently in a lame duck session in Congress. So there's not that many bills that may be moving other than a concurrent resolu a concurring resolution for uh, the federal government to be funded as well as perhaps the National uh, Defense Authorization Act. Those are two things that may be moving during this lame duck session. Uh, H.R. 1848 by Congressman Filoni would rebuild and modernize the nation's infrastructure to expand access to broadband and next gen 911. Uh, and that is currently in the house uh, as well. And it hasn't really moved uh, from, from uh, it's intro. Uh, another another bill, HR 1859 by uh, Congressman uh, Smith, Adam Smith, would authorize the Secretary of Health and Human Services acting through the Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance uh, Use to award grants to states, territories, political subdivisions of states and territories, tribal governments, and consortia of tribal governments to establish an unarmed 911 response program and for other purposes. Again, that is also in the House, uh, has not moved, and is currently in the uh, Subcommittee on Health. Uh, another bill that has been around as well for is the Kelsey Smith Act, Senate Bill 466 by Senator Moran, which would require a mobile or internet voice service provider to disclose the location information of a device pursuant to certain requests. That uh, had actually passed the Senate, but has been sitting in the House since last year. And lastly, Senate Bill 1175, the 911 Saves Act by Senator Burton, uh, would, categorize, uh, would categorize public safety telecommunicators as a protective service occupation under the standard occupational classification system. And that is also in the Senate. Okay, thank you, Mr. Salvador. Um, do we have any questions from the board? All right, any comments or questions from the public? All right, seeing, hearing none. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Move on to agenda item number five. Um, we're gonna get an update from Mr. Paul Troxell um, on some uh, information from the 911 branch. Good morning, everybody. Paul Troxell with the 911 branch. Uh, thank you for joining us all this morning. Um, here's a list of the topics that we'll be briefing out today. Um, I'd like to first start with our 911 stats. This is a typical slide that we've had in prior briefings is we're closing out 2022. We are starting to analyze uh, where we sit. Uh, we did uh, some predictive analysis. Um, it, it's showing that we're going to have a slower year this year. Um, we are still trying to figure out why that is and take a look at what's happening at the local level. Um, so we'll brief some more out on uh, what happened in 2022 when we meet in February. With the uh, legacy call processing equipment, um, we've briefed out some of the challenges that we've had. Um, in this uh, advisory board, we wanted to go into the three distinct testing processes and what we're finding. Uh, we did talk about this briefly in closed session as Budge had briefed out. We wanted to point this out to everybody in open session. Um, the, the first thing that we're testing is compliance with the interface control document that's required by our prime network service provider. And that's the defining document for that interface between 
call processing equipment and the NG911 network. And that allows that call to flow in and out in the dispatcher to be able to answer that. Um, the interface document, um, interface control document, um, they've had to build in some workarounds because of some of the limitations that we found with our legacy CPE. Um, and we did define a way to overcome some of those limitations in the future slide, I'll point that out. The second testing that we're doing is the contract requirements for legacy call processing equipment. When we purchased our, uh, our CPE, we purchased with the requirement that it met I3, the NINA I3 standard. Uh, and when that contract was signed in 2017, there was no NG911 lab to validate that. Now we do have an NG911 lab and it allows us to do some testing and we're finding uh, limitations to the legacy call processing equipment where it does not meet the I3 compliance. Um, so that has created um, a big challenge for our team in our NG911 service providers uh, to take a look at how do we deliver a 911 call to legacy uh, solutions. And then the third uh, testing process that we're going through is our cloud-based call processing. Um, we do have a slide to identify um, what uh, cloud systems we do have and where some of the other uh, providers are in the testing process. Um, one of the biggest benefits that we've received out of our NG911 lab is prior to going live with any of these solutions, we can validate the contract requirements are being met. We can validate the I3 standard is being met. So when we deploy, we have a greater understanding of what needs to happen at installation to be able to deliver that call through the NG911 network, through cloud CPE to the dispatcher. So what we found, this data is aggregated with our legacy CPE providers. So here we have some of the I3 requirements have been partially met. We have some of the I3 requirements they have failed to meet. And then we had eight additional I3 requirements. We knew if they couldn't do those uh, requirements, there was need, no even need to test those additional eight. They couldn't meet them. So here is, is a basic report card with some of the challenges, challenges that we've seen in our lab and trying to deploy the NG911 network. And um, our provider and the Cal OES team have had to come together, figure out how do we deploy, continue to get NG911 rolled out and still be able to support uh, legacy CPE. So this graphic has been one that you've seen before. The difference is the red box there about the middle of the screen, the alley box. This is the workaround that's been developed. Um, one of the challenges that we found is CPE cannot take an NG911 uh, location, push through CPE to CAD. So this alley emulation box will bring next gen location in, turn it to a serial um, uh, delivery through serial port down through uh, CAD system. And it will allow that um, legacy CPE to display location, display the number information, give the dispatcher the information that they need. They can push it to CAD and continue the uh, call flow. Everything else on that graphic is still accurate in the way of the testing process, the installation process with the NG911 service provider, the legacy CPE provider, whoever your maintenance provider is. The only difference is we've got this, um, this one workflow inserted to install the alley emulation box. Yeah, go ahead, there's a question. So with the alley box, um, is there going to be someone or technician or someone coming to each PSAP to install these boxes to the individual PSAP? And what's the timeline anticipated for this to happen? So yes, there will be a technician. It does require a site visit. Um, and I believe the way this is going to roll out and Andrew and Budge, keep me honest, um, they're going to go the phase one PSAPs first, where we planned on deploying and then through the rest of that list and, and get 100% deployment over time. Yeah, and just to clarify, um, if you're wondering, has it been tested yet? Yes, uh, Imperial County uh, and El Dorado County have these deployed today uh, and they're working on the, the network as, as we speak today. Thank you. 
it, thank you for that, Budge. I was going to point that out on this slide here. Uh, some good news since our last meeting in August. Um, in Tuolumne County, we have cut AT&T Mobility. So they have um, T-Mobile, Verizon, uh, Frontier Landline, and AT&T Mobility on NG911 network. And I believe the, that accounts for about 90% of their workload is on NG911 today and working. The alley emulation box has been installed there for quite some time, and it is working. Um, since our last meeting, uh, we did go live in South Lake Tahoe. Uh, T-Mobile was deployed there last week. Um, I would like to take a second to recognize Angela Chen, who's our Northern Region Project Manager, uh, Gail Kin, who's our uh, Regional Coordinator, and then uh, Kurt Galat, who is now our 988 Advisor uh, and uh, Project Manager, uh, who was there supporting uh, Gail and Angela. Uh, they drove up after the little snowstorm that they had to be there to support Synergym in the testing and go live process. Um, when they got up there, everything worked through perfectly. They were able to cut and have a successful deployment there. So we now have a second county uh, deployed with NG911. Uh, we do have a team down in Imperial County today doing some testing. Uh, the plan, if all the testing is successful, they will cut and go live in Imperial County today. So exciting, good news happening. Um, and it's it's been a lot of work by our team and the, the NG911 service provider. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize all that hard work. Our statewide CPE installation, one of the challenges that we had because of the uh, contract and I-3 compliance, we did have to put a moratorium on, on, on the uh, sale of legacy CPE. Um, so this year, 2022, we are down to eight successful uh, deployments and installations. Those have been uh, works that were in progress. Um, we do have quite a few agencies who are pushing to go to cloud CPE. Uh, Janae Dabrowski's team is fully engaged. We have a, a couple active deployments, and then we have a bunch of PSAPs contacting the team requesting their updated uh, allotment letters, what the process is, um, and Janae and her team have been really um, organized to uh, do some demo, uh, some organized demo days showing the cloud CPE solutions, both here at our uh, PSE campus, as well as down in the uh, Los Angeles area. We have a few more coming up. Um, they've been very successful to show what this technology is. It is new, it is different. Um, so, um, you know, a huge uh, kudo to Janae and her team um, for all the work and all the vendors that supported those days. So in 2023, we do expect um, deployments to go up um, and take less time. So here we have uh, our cloud CPE solutions. Um, on the lower right corner, we have Lumen, Autos, and NGA who are live, cleared, tested, validated all through the lab. They are available for purchase today. If any PSAP is interested, uh, contact Janae and her team and they can uh, point you to the right contacts for those uh, companies. Um, we are happy to announce that Entrato and Rapid Deploy CPE um, are completing the phase one testing process and are, are engaging uh, to the phase two testing process. Um, depending on um, exact timelines and um, how testing goes, that could be as early as early 2023, uh, but likely March-ish for those solutions to get validated through the lab and be available. And then we'll have five uh, CPE solutions available on contract. Uh, we do still have Motorola and Carbine who are engaged in the conversation. However, they have not uh, engaged in phase one testing at this time. In this graphic, uh, we did have an addition to the uh, PSAP advisor uh, team. That's Anita Lopez. Uh, she joined the team here about four or five months ago. So she's uh, received some um, county assignments and she is also the 988 advisor. We did have one retirement on the team. That position is still vacant. We're hoping to get that posted and filled soon. Um, so this graphic is just the updated contact. Um, I'd leave this in uh, for everybody to take back to your uh, represented organizations, professional associations, and PSAPs to share. And Janae's information is there on the bottom. If you have any questions about the team, 
um, reach out to Janae or your um, PCEP advisor direct. Yes, sir. Just a question on the um, counties that fall under the vacant. Are they uh, to contact their previous advisor or how is that handled during the vacancy? Uh, contact Janae. Um, what she's done is she's divvied up some of those counties for the other team members to, to oversee while that vacancy is there. So Janae will get you in, in touch with the right person. A uh, quick update on some of the procurements that we have going on. Our recruiting, retention, and training request for proposal is still actively moving. Um, I'm engaged with the uh, Cal OES procurement team. Um, the contract that um, drafted RFP is being reviewed and will go through DGS review prior to going out live. We are on track. We do expect an early 2023 contract execution for that contract question. Will we have access to seeing who are the bidders for the RFP, for the training RFP? And I don't believe so. I believe that uh, all the bidders, while they're going through evaluation, will be confidential. And then once the contract is awarded, that data will be made public. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the 988 call processing equipment, uh, that procurement is actively moving forward. The evaluations um, are happening. Um, and they expect a contract award by December of 2022. And that will um, support all of the 13988 centers in the state. And then we have some uh, pending activities that we've been discussing for quite some time. Uh, Cal OES, we would like to do a statewide logging audio log contract, similar to our um, uh, CPE master purchase agreement, get multiple vendors on contract. And at the local level, if you need an audio logger that needs to support something in addition to what CPE has in the cloud CPE contract, you would have that procurement vehicle available to you. Um, and then the uh, statewide CAD multi-vendor um, contract, the same thing. We would like to do a statewide master purchase agreement for multiple CAD vendors to be on contract. Um, and that would be an available procurement vehicle for the uh, local agencies to engage um, and hopefully uh, gain the buying power of the state of California to get a reduced price on that CAD system. I had a question regarding the um, cloud-based recorder. Do you know offhand if there's support in that contract for recording the local radio channels or is it just the um, telephone? Andrew, when you did cloud CPE, we had they had to connect into local PBX and local radio as well, correct? Just telephony. Just telephony. Okay. Thank yeah, you. But but the new one would. That's that's what yes. we're looking at. Yeah. The existing one, there's that gap, which is the need for this. Yeah. yeah. And then funding. Um, it, I would like to um, again express my appreciation for the professional um, organizations that the 911 Advisory Board represents. Um, the support of all the peace apps in 2019. Assembly Bill 96 was moving through and that uh, was reshaping the set in a funding model um, that was successful and that has allowed us a good stable funding mechanism to support the, the state operations, what we do here at Cal OES and the support that we provide all of the PSAPs in California. So this is our current fund condition statement as of July of 2022. And then this is our uh, fee calculation. Our last meeting in August, we were still pending uh, some of the carriers to provide us their um, access line data. Um, that requirement was met. We received all of that access line data. We were able to take the information out of the fund condition statement, plug in all of the data for the formula and determine it was our recommendation that for the calendar year 2023, that the uh, fee remain at 30 cents. And we did provide the analysis between 2021 and 2022 uh, there on the right hand of that slide. And if you notice, uh, wireline and VoIP did decline in 2022 and the wireless did increase. Not significant amount, but there is continued change in those areas. So um, we're very happy to say that we've been able to maintain that 30 cents that's where it was originally set. 
um, and we um, that information has been to, sent over to the California Department of uh, Taxation and Fee Administration, and, and um, that was our intention um, with this slide. If there's any questions. Okay. Okay, so that concludes agenda item number five. Um, any questions from the board for Mr. Troxel? All right. Any questions or comments from the public? All right. Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item number six. Mr. Troxel, you're still in the hot seat, so take it away. Thank you. Um, so I did send out the uh, drafted um, chapter for the operations manual for alert and warning. Um, I was hoping to be able to get it done earlier so we'd have a little bit more time to digest it at this meeting. Um, so I'm asking if you could review that and provide any feedback uh, through track changes to that document and return that by Wednesday, November 30th. Uh, we will, again, collect that data, get that revised. Um, I think we're very close to the first iteration of a final chapter. Uh, we do know initially this is going to be a living document. We'll post it. We'll continue to get feedback either through this board the long range planning committee or our locals using the solution. Um, so we, we do know that we'll have some revisions moving forward. Um, here is the graphic we reported out on in uh, August. This is the testing results from the rave alert solution. Um, the, re the contract requires that the alert and warning solution support 250,000 uh, notifications uh, per minute. And here we have uh, two examples where RAVE was able to support um, text, voice calls, and email uh, in excess of that 250,000 requirement. And this graphic shows um, all of the systems that are live, every agency that's live in, this, in the uh, RAVE alert warning solution. We have almost 2.4 million notifications that have been sent out since March. Um, I'm very proud of the uh, Autos and the RAVE um, Alert Morning Solution team. They have been actively engaging PSAPs, actively um, supporting whatever those uh, deployment needs are. And El Dorado County is identified here on the list, and they had a significant amount of uh, notifications that were sent when they had their fire here a couple of months ago. So um, they did use this solution only for community-based notifications. They could not use it for IPAWS uh, because FEMA could not get their uh, IPAWS certificate back to them in time. So for the IPAWS alerting, they used their legacy system. For community alerting, they used this system. And the reports back was it was um, worked as designed. And they were extremely pleased with the solution. Here's our total engagement. The uh, green represents those that are live and using the solution 100% of the time. The purple uh, is showing those uh, agencies who've committed to go and they're in some phase of deployment. Their system's being built out, their data is being in inputted, um, their logons and everything. The training is all happening in the background. So we continue to get agencies to sign up for this solution. Uh, and, and again, the RAVE team has been able to meet all of the uh, the locals needs um, to support alert and warning in California. Here's our contact. If anybody has uh, any questions regarding the uh, RAVE alert warning solution, uh, Earl Cook is the Autos project manager and Michael Elder from our team is our uh, project manager. Okay, that concludes agenda item number six. Do we have any questions or comments from the board on that? I just wanted to comment to thank you for putting together the policy thing and address what my concerns was with just a basic framework. So if an agency signs up um, from our perspective, anyways, we've done some due diligence. Um, so thank you for putting that uh, together. The second thing was just a clarifying point. If there's a city that is not a PSAP, but they're interested, are they covered or they have to be a PSAP to fall under this? They have to be, they can be an alerting authority that is a city that's not a PSAP. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other questions from the board on this? This was a 
a topic we've been discussing for quite a few boards and we, we tried to put together some information that'd be helpful. So we really would appreciate your feedback on this if you've got any further comments. Okay, any uh, comments from the public on this agenda item? All right, seeing and hearing none. Thank you, sir. The next agenda item number seven is on uh, the 988 update. Uh, this was added as an agenda item at our last board meeting. Uh, we know the importance of this. Uh, Mr. Salvador provided an update on AB 988. And uh, what we've got on this slide really is just a high level summary of some of the stuff that's in the statute. Um, so if you've read AB 988, there's nothing earth shattering on this slide, um, but it is a rather long bill because the revenue and tax code updates are also included in there and, and there's quite a bit of reading. So we wanted to kind of give a, a summary here. Um, it, it does establish these 988 centers using the digits 988 and it requires uh, Cal OES and Health and Human Services to do several things. Um, the slide is not exhaustive. There is a lot more that is contained in AB 988 in terms of execution. Um, but we've, you know, one of the key takeaways in here is the integration between 988 and 911 uh, to validate that by July of 2024. And it also establishes a 98 surcharge uh, at eight cents in the statute for the first two calendar years. So that's 2023 and 2024. That is a 98 surcharge that goes into Setna. So it borrows sort of the Setna structure. 911 is separate. 98 is separate, but it borrowed kind of that infrastructure, uh, and Cal OES is administering that. Uh, we're the ones that do the access line reporting and all that, so that's how that statute is set up. Uh, we'll report out more detail, but like I said, for the first two years, it's already set at $0.08. Cents. Um, subsequent surcharges are based on the authorized budget, so the process is the same as 911. The 988 budget is authorized in the governor's budget as ratified in the legislature. That budget is then said, okay, that's the maximum revenue you can bring in. You take the number of access lines, you do the math. That's how you set the fee to meet the authorized budget. Same exact process that we just briefed out for the 911 surcharge. It's, it's all the same. There are a couple of other things that we have to do. Uh, we being Cal OES um, by the first 90 days, which if you do the math is December 28th. So if you back that up, that means before Christmas, because we obviously want to get this done before we go on Christmas break. Uh, we need to appoint a 988 system director. We're working on that. And we need to establish the 988 technical advisory board. The statute establishes two boards, an advisory board for policy that's administered by Health and Human Services and an advisory board for technical matters that, that is administered by Cal OES. We have a draft membership list here. This is subject to change. We think this is pretty solid now. You can imagine the number of folks we have to coordinate with to get this list vetted. Um, the statute lists broad categories of stakeholders that need to be considered. And so it doesn't specifically name like the 911 statute does the exact members of the board. So the members of the 911 advisory board are very specific in statute and they're appointed by the governor. This one just lists stakeholder groups that need to be represented. The goal here is to ensure the interaction between 988 and 911. So you're gonna see there's a, there's a cross section of both 911 folks as well as 988 folks. And then you've got to bring in some of the behavioral health aspect as well. So the list is still being vetted and developed, um, but we think this is pretty close to what it'll end up being. Um, and we're shoot, we're targeting uh, the first board meeting to be on December 8th from 10 to 12. Uh, and we'll put out public notice and it'll be a Bagley Keen managed board just like this is. So you can expect more details to come on that. So any questions or comments on, on that? I have a couple questions, Budge. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Can you talk a little bit about the 988 system director, that position? Um, so the statute calls out for Cal OES to appoint a 988 system director. We're still in the process of identifying that. 
in a perfect world, uh, we would have received the authority in our budget in July to hire that person. We did not. Um, we will work on that authority in the next budget cycle. So between now and then, we'll probably have to name an interim and we'll um, have to absorb those uh, from within our existing staff. And then that'll uh, more than likely, depending on the process that happens for the upcoming budget year, we'll, we'll try and get authorized for that to, to name that permanent position. So you can expect probably an interim to be named. And then from there, we'll move forward with the formal process, probably take us another year to get there. So just confirming that's a position that will be staffed by a Cal OES employee. Correct. Okay. Yeah, the statute is very clear on that, that it's it's staffed by a Cal OES person. Second question, um, the, on slide 23, the list of the members of the board, and just confirming, this is not going to be governor-appointed positions, correct? Correct. The statute does not say that the membership has to be governor-appointed, so... We're working through a process um, internal on how that will be done, but yeah, it'll be, it, we're working collaboratively with every stakeholder group that you see on this list to make sure that we haven't missed anyone. Um, so that's the process we're in right now. Once the list is agreed upon, then we'll go through a process of actually appointing uh, people to fill those spots. The other group that you mentioned that sounds, so there's two groups, there's a 98 TAC committee which is that that you have on the slide. And then there's a second one that's governed by health services. Yeah, California Health and Human Services will manage that board. Who, well, obviously they're managing it, but is there any influence, excuse me, from the branch office as to who will sit on that board? Will there be a 911 PSAP community representative representative on that board? If, if I recall the statute correctly, OES has a seat on that board. And we are working closely with closely with Health and Human Services with the Assistant Secretary Stephanie Welch. Um, we I talk to her weekly, um, and and we're in close communication. So yes, we want to make sure that that connection is there. But it's their board, and we're working with them. You know, we we obviously it's their process, but we are in close communication to make sure this is a, a real collaborative effort there. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, some of the things that this board is doing, and these come straight out of the statute. So if you're wondering where these bullets came from, this is exactly what's in statute. Um, they're looking at you know the feasibility and a plan for sustained interoperability between 911 and 988, hence the need for the makeup of that board. Obviously, there's a behavioral um, health crisis service that's that's included in there, and then all the the legislative and 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 regulatory and legal and other things that need to be considered, both on the 911 side and the 988 side to transfer calls back and forth. You understand there's a lot of complexity there. The technical and operational standards for the 988 system, similar to what we do in the 911 system, that this this board will oversee that. And then protocols for this, the 98 centers to move calls from 98 to 911 and then vice versa. And then once the plan is developed, the implementation plan for 98, which is a, a date further down the line, whatever technical work is needed to support things like mobile crisis teams or the entire care continuum that's gonna be considered as part of this 98 process, those te technical aspects would all be rolled into this board as well. So that's kind of what this board will be doing. Um, very similar to how this board functions with 911. Question. Yeah, go ahead, Brenda. So when, once the board is established, will there be an operation manual of sorts, how the two entities will interact, how what the expectation is of each one, and how collaboratively they will work together. So yes, but that's part of the implementation plan. Um, and if you go back to um, this slide, I think it's on here. No, I don't think I have it. I think I have it on next steps. Let's see. There is the call out for an implementation plan. I wanna say it was December of 2024, but there's an implementation plan that Health and Human Services is developing as a result of the policy side. And that document will drive some of the technology. So that linkage has to be in place. Um, but initially, 
the charter for that board is captured in these three bullets. That's all that the statute um, calls out. So the short answer to your question is yes, but what level of detail I think we're gonna have to walk through as that board is formed. Yeah, maybe even sit, then crawl, then walk, then run. And we're probably at this, yeah, yeah, yeah. First, sit, crawl, walk, run. And we're probably at the sitting stage where we're gonna come together to have these conversations, yeah. So next steps, um, we're continuing to work through the 988 procurement process that was authorized through a budget change proposal. So it started before AB 988 was even um, signed into uh, law. So that's why that process is farther along. We knew that that needed to happen. And we've been working on that. We'll do the, the call processing equipment installs. The, it's, a, it's a whole call handling system suite and including answering the calls and the customer relationship management software and interacting with everything that's at the 988 centers, all that's included. And then begin to have these conversations on best practices, procedures between 911 and 988 transfer, just to understand the process so the technology can support the process. And then we've got a, obviously a lot of collaboration to be done. Um, this is a, a new partnership. And those of you that are working with your mental health professionals in your uh, counties and, and local areas, you know that they're distinctly different than 911. Um, the analogy I like to use is for a 911 operator, you get about 90 seconds, right? That's it. And the call's done. And if you don't get it done in 90 seconds, they're moving on because there's a whole queue of other folks. In the 9 and 8 space, the average call duration is 20 minutes. So it's a completely different conversation. And the two need to come together because there's times where they need to work together. Either a call comes into 911 that should be 988 or a call came into 988 that escalates and needs emergency response. And so that's really what this whole conversation is about. Um, and just really understanding those differences. Um, and then the, the implementation plan will be developed. The, this board will have to adjust the technology to support that implementation plan. Um, that'll be a key part of what this does. And again, we're gonna meet on December 8th in this room uh, from 10 to 12. So you, uh, if you're interested, you can certainly um, participate. The first meeting is probably gonna focus a lot on the, the fact that it's Bagley Keen and here's how the board is conducted and here's what the, the board is about and answering these initial questions, really introducing members one to another because it'll be the first time that they've come together as a group. So we're, we're looking forward to that. So any other questions on agenda item seven? I want to make sure we've, we've covered your questions. We know there's a lot of discussion on this. Any questions from the board? Okay, any questions from the public? Okay, a couple. Go ahead, sir. Mike's here. Uh, three minutes for public comment. So take it away, sir. So I'm, I'm Robert Bennett, um, VP and technology consultant for WorkVantage. Um, back to slide 23, I noticed that um, you have a list of crisis folks, fire agencies, public safety. On a technical advisory committee, you don't actually have anybody representing the technology vendors that are going to provide this service for you or, or to, to weigh in on the viability of some of these ideas. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, so the makeup of this board is very similar. The 988 board is very similar to the 911 board. Uh, historically, um, there hasn't been any vendors on these boards. Uh, I think we do a really good job on the 911 advisory board of hearing from the vendor community, uh, and we welcome the partnership. Um, so we're hoping that we continue that collaborative uh, exchange of information. The other challenge, too, I think is, is worth noting um, if a vendor is overly involved in the development of policy, they're automatically restricted from up, um, applying to any procurement. And uh, we're pretty sure that a vendor would not want to put themselves in that situation either. So I think we're trying to balance those two. But your, your comment is, is very valid. We absolutely need a partnership with the vendor community, and we appreciate the input. Terrific. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. Another public comment, I think. Go ahead. We just so everybody online can hear you.
Yeah, my question is just, are there public, is, is there public education funds associated with this new bill or would that be a future uh, budget consideration? So I don't, I think that's a future consideration and probably more on the policy side. So I'm not as familiar with that, but a good question. I, I just don't know offhand the answer to that. Okay. I know at the federal level, SAMHSA is handling some of that, and there is some, some outreach done at that level, but I think that's probably going to fall more on the policy side. Yeah, just because, I mean, the, the public's going to have to understand how this whole thing works, and there needs to be a good push for that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So we are gonna move on to agenda item number eight. And I believe we have the chair of the long range uh, planning committee, Chris Heron online. So Chris, if you're there, take it away, sir. I'm here, can you hear me okay? A little muffled, maybe Don can, hmm. the mixing magic man can give him some more volume. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, well, we'll try it. Um, good morning. Since the last advisory board meeting in August, the LRPC met in October and again yesterday. Um, the Next Gen 911 task force groups also met this quarter and we received updates from them uh, as well as OES on the progress of the Next Gen 911 implementation. Uh, these uh, task force groups also provide a good opportunity for OES to discuss many of their projects with the cross representation of PSAPs, uh, making for a very collaborative process, as we've talked about in the past. And part of our discussion yesterday included a conversation about the focus of the LRPC. Um, you know, we want to ensure that we continue to provide value to the advisory board and OES without too much duplication of effort uh, in terms of the work that goes on here at the advisory board and as well as sort of the working groups and task forces, sort of kind of that in the middle uh, body, if you will. Um, our plan is to have an LRPC overview for distribution to the advisory board, uh, either prior to or in conjunction with your February meeting, uh, February 23, that is. Uh, in that overview, we'll provide some history of the LRPC, which goes back more than a decade now. Um, projects that we've worked on, associated accomplishments, and then where we see our focus over the next few years. Uh, items that are likely to be included in that focus would include the recruitment and retention project, which is targeted to have an RFP release in early 23, uh, PSAP 911 answer times, the next gen 911 dynamic call routing, and then of course, what was just discussed, the 988 integration with the 911 system. Uh, we feel like each of these has broad implications that are longer term and thus a fit for the LRPC format, which is quarterly public meetings. Uh, I think we'll continue to have and need the working groups or task forces where we can essentially hand off some of these projects once the advisory board and LRPC guidance is given so that OES can work directly with PSAP uh, representatives and get much quicker interaction and feedback on details that aren't suited to wait for these quarterly meetings. So uh, what we ask of you is that you be thinking about other topics or projects that you want the LRPC to have on its radar so that you can provide us with that feedback and direction in February. Uh, lastly, I want to mention that uh, LRPC members and the appointment of the chair uh, are are all at the discretion of the advisory board. We have all six organizations from the advisory board represented on the LRPC now for the first time in quite a few years. And while you all get to hear from me at each of your meetings, we hope that there's a line of communication where each of you can hear from and interact with your counterparts on the LRPC and provi really provide guidance to them that is a representative of the parent organizations. So I'm going to share our membership uh, document with our contact information, email, and phone numbers with, with you via OES. So I'll ask them to provide that to each of you. So our next meeting is in February. As I said, we'll have that um, sort of overview summary document about the LRPC to you before that. And uh, end of report, unless there's any questions. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you. Um, and any questions from the board? We we think we're, we're trying to encourage some more interaction between the board and the LRPC. So in February, when Chris gives his update, he'll provide you some history. Those that have been on the board for a while, 
historically, the board has gone back to their member organizations and said, hey, did you guys think about X and X? And then that's brought back to the LRPC. The LRPC takes that as a task, and then they go out and discover whatever that innovation is. And we just want to make sure that that mechanism is in place. So we really asked Chris to address the board with that intent. And then in February, we're hoping to come back very purposefully. Um, so between now and then, I think the ask is um, go poll your groups that you represent and see if you have some activities that the LRPC should be looking at and then bring them back to the LRPC chair um, as well as to uh, this board so that we can agendize them and get them moving forward as, as projects. So any questions or comments on that? Yeah, Chris, I, I definitely wanna thank you and, and the LRPC for the work you've been doing and, and helping collaborate with OES as, um, as we dream up these crazy things to do. They're our sounding board. Uh, and it's hugely valuable for us. Um, there's been several things where we thought we could be of help and the LRPC has said, no, thank you. We don't need that kind of help. Um, and then there's been other ideas where we've said the same thing and they said, absolutely, we need the help. And, and here's how you can be more helpful in that way. So it's been a great partnership and uh, we appreciate the work of that group is doing. And we just want to make sure that you guys recognize that it's there as an extension of the 9-1 Advisory Board and you have the ability uh, to uh, bring things up to them with taskers. So um, any other comments from the board? Okay, comments or questions from the public on that agenda item? All right, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for the report. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so we've set our agenda for uh, 2023. Um, we basically took the same schedule we've been using for the past couple of years uh, with the same kind of weekly rhythm and everything. We think that there aren't any major events or you know, association meetings or you know, those kinds of things that we're aware of. Uh, the schedule can be adjusted. Uh, please let us know if this doesn't work. And if we don't hear anything fat back from you, then we, you know, silence is consent. Uh, but this is what we set up for the board um, in the future. And um, there are some changes uh, potentially coming for Bagley Keen that we'll be uh, tracking closely. So um, obviously, there's a couple of our members today that are participating remotely. That was a change that happened uh, this last legislative cycle. Uh, we do need a majority of members present in person, I believe, is still the rule. So uh, please work closely with the 9-1 branch, whether you're able to be here or not. It's much better in person, trust me. Um, but uh, we do understand the, the need to support remote members. So any questions or comments on the meeting dates for the next year? Now, if you're tracking the way OES does boards, the 988 boards will be very close to these dates as well as the CalSeq boards, the California Statewide Interoperability Executive Council, mainly because it reduces our logistics in setting this room up. <laughs> so Brenda, go ahead. Yes, so I do wanna say that this is my last advisory board meeting. Um, this will be my final term. I'm chairman out in January. So there will be a new APCO representative that I have yet to get the name to announce but it's, it's been very interactive and great opportunity to serve on this board. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you for your service. And I believe, Sheriff Ayub, uh, this may be your last board as well. Is that correct, sir? Yes, uh, that, that's right. I'm retiring at the end of the year and, and uh, regret, regrettably, this will be my last meeting and uh, the state sheriff's will um, recommend another person for appointment to the board in my place. Thank you all. all right. for Thank me. you, Sheriff, for your service. We appreciate the support. And uh, Chief Baxter from CHB, welcome aboard. You're our newest member, so we're excited to have you. And uh, um, as you can see, uh, you know we, we've got a pretty busy year coming up. Uh, yes, I'm very excited to be back uh, working with you, Budge, and being a member of this board. So looking forward to the future. And also new on the board today is Mark Chase. You thought I was going to forget you, but I did not. Uh, so Mark is representing Cal Nina, and I think there's a process underway uh, to get that formalized. But welcome aboard. I know you're sitting in for Liam this week. 
Um, but uh, in February, uh, we hope that you're permanent. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay, any other comments from the board on this agenda item? Fudge, I have a question. For the 988 tac uh, Tactical Committee in um, conjunction with the meetings we have posted here, do we expect them to be the day before, the day after? Day after, right? So it's the CalSeq meets on Tuesdays, the 911 Advisory Board is Wednesdays, and the 988 Technical Advisory Board is, is Thursdays. Unless something changes, that's what we've set up. Okay. Thank you. Yep, just so that we all know. And the 98 times are the same, and CalSeq is the same, 10 to 12. So all the times are the same. Wow, we, we must be pretty simple. <laughs> oh, I like that. It was probably my idea. They're like, we got to keep this simple for Bud. She's hard enough to wrangle in. <laughs> okay, any other questions from the board on this? Okay, any questions from the public on agenda item number nine? Budgets, Chris Heron, could you just um, verbalize the dates of the meetings in 2023? Because we can't see the slides um, for those of us online. Oh, I, I thought we were sharing online. So I might. At least I can't. Maybe it's just me. No, it's probably us, Chris. It's okay. Usually we're the source of the problem. Okay. Uh, February 15th, uh, 2023. And then May 17th. August 16th and November 15th. And the times are all the same from 10 to 12. Thank you. Yep. And those should all be Wednesdays if we got it right. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, moving on. Agenda item number 10, uh, public comment. Any public comment that wasn't addressed um, by uh, the individual items that we've already gone over. Okay, any comments from the board that was not adjust, uh, uh, accounted for in the agenda items we already had? All right, seeing and hearing none. Your favorite slide, item 11, adjourn. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. So we have a motion from Brenda. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Mark. All right. I think I'm supposed to do a roll call, aren't I? All right. I better follow the rules. All right. Chief Baxter, you. Present. Oh, well, I think it's a yes or no on this one, Chief. Oh, sorry. You you agree to adjourn? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Brenda? Yes. Mark? Yes. Rosa? Yes. Sheriff Braun? Yes. Sheriff Ayub? Yes. Uh, Chief Ramirez? Yes. Captain Warren? Yes. And Chief White? Yes. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. The time is 1132.